There's a passage where the Buddha says that all things are rooted in desire. Everything you experience is shaped by desire. And a lot of the desire leads to suffering, but not all of it. There is the desire that underlies the path. There is in the discourse we chanted just now. And the Buddha sets out the Four Noble Truths. He's setting out the whole framework for a right view, the framework for his teaching. But before he sets out the framework, he talks about why it's a good framework, why you would want to adopt it, why you'd want to pick up the duties that it entails. It leads to clear knowing. It leads to unbinding total freedom for the mind. And like the other two extremes, it doesn't lead to suffering. It leads away from suffering. So he starts out by trying to motivate you, give rise to the desire that you would like to try this path as well. This is important because sometimes we're told that the path means having no desire at all. Let's get you all tied up in knots, then why would you practice it? You have to realize that some desires are good, and you want to cultivate them. Because the path is not going to happen all on its own. That's another misunderstanding that's out there, that somehow if you just let things take their natural course, they would go automatically to nirvana. And there is a stream that leads to nirvana, as I say, but it takes a lot of effort to get to that particular stream. The other streams we tend to f follow are the ones that go down to waterfalls and whirlpools and basically death and destruction, lots and lots of suffering. So we have to go against the current, those streams, in order to get to the stream that leads to nirvana. So you have to learn how to give yourself pep talks along the way. And realize that desire has to be handled with care. If you focus too much attention on where you want to go and not enough on what you're doing, you're not, not doing what you're doing very well at all. You're not taking care of the causes. You have to focus your desire on the causes, and the results are going to take care of themselves. One of the things we need to desire is to have a little bit more equanimity. When the Buddha taught breath meditation to Rahula, there was one time when Rahula was going on an alms round with the Buddha, and the Buddha taught him about seeing all the aggregates as not self. Pretty advanced teaching. So Rahula goes back, doesn't even continue the alms round, he goes back to the monastery right there sits down and meditates, tries to figure this out. Sariputta comes along, sees Rahula sitting there, and recommends that he try breath meditation. So that evening Rahula goes to see the Buddha and asks him how to do breath meditation. The Buddha starts out with a series of contemplations. And one of them is making the mind like earth, making the mind like water, making it like wind, making it like fire. Each of these elements, when it beats up with something unpleasant, doesn't shrink back. So in the same way, when pleasant and unpleasant things happen, you have to learn how not to get bowled over by them. Notice this is not the end of the practice, when you here just to become very equanimous about things. Because eventually the Buddha does get around to talking about how to do breath meditation. It's a very proactive practice. You try to breathe in certain ways, you try to focus on certain things, give rise to certain things as you're breathing. There are steps where you try to give rise to a sense of rapture, give rise to a sense of pleasure. Steps when you gladden the mind, or steady the mind, or release the mind. 
There's a lot of doing in these steps. The point is that before you start a lot of the doing, you have to get the mind really, really still and really on a solid basis where it can look at things and see what's skillful and see what's not. And if you can't admit to yourself that you're doing unskillful things, you're never going to be able to learn to change your habits. It was one of the Ajahns at the time who had a lot of Western students. And they had a commemoration of him one time. And all the stories they told were about how he taught them that they needed more equanimity and they needed more patience. That was the foundation that he felt that most Westerners lacked. And some of them took it as the whole, whole of the practice, which is not. It's the beginning. You have to learn how to look at yourself very clearly. When something comes along, the mind has a tendency to want to dress it up. If it's really good, you dress it up as really good. If it's really bad, you dress it up as really bad. And then you get all excited about it. Well, this habit of wanting to get excited about things is going to get in the way of your meditation. You have to learn to have a sense of an awareness that's separate from these things. So when something good happens, you can see that it is something good, but you want to keep your mind on an even keel. Don't go running into it, jumping into it. Same with something bad. You don't want to go running away from it, pretending it's not there. You've got to see it clearly for what it is. Especially when you're looking at your own bad habits. You can tell yourself over and over again, that's a really bad habit, I really don't like it, and yet you keep going back to it again and again and again. It's like the person who says it doesn't like potato chips, but then you find him gobbling potato chips down when nobody else is looking, and he even thinks he himself is not looking. Suddenly there it is, there's the potato chip bag in his hand, and he's halfway through the bag. That's the way a lot of us are about our unskillful habits. We see that they're bad, we don't like them, and yet we don't admit to ourselves that there's something in there that we like. And unless you can find a state of mind where you can be on an even keel, and not get blown away by good or bad things, that's when you can see why you go for these things. What, it is, what is it in those potato chips that you really like? And often you find something about it that you don't really like about yourself, some habit. But if you don't see those unpleasant habits, unpleasant ways of thinking, unpleasant ways of taking nourishment, you're not going to be able to get past them. You have to say, oh yeah, there really is that thing that I like about this. And ask yourself, is it really worth it? As the Buddha says, if you want to understand things, you have to see them come and you have to see them go. And you have to look for their allure and their drawbacks. Why is it you like going there? What are the drawbacks, though? And then find what's the escape? You have to look and see where the passion is for those things. And look at them in such a way that you don't want to go there anymore. It's like reading that book, The Secret House, where they talk about all the awful things that are in processed food, and all the fish scales that they put into ice cream. And in fact, the potato chips have very little, not very much potato in them at all. It's mostly congealed grease. Then it's fried. And after reading that book, you don't want to eat any ice cream for quite a while, or the potato chips, because you see actually what's there. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha has us look very clearly at what our pleasures are and see what they're made of. That analysis into the five aggregates may sound very abstract, but it's very directly connected to how the mind feeds. There's the 
form of the body and there's the form of the food. There's the feeling of hunger in the body, the feeling of pleasure that comes when you eat. That's feeling. There's the perception of what's edible and what's not edible. There's also the perception of what kind of hunger you're feeling right now. And I'm trying to figure out what's going to satisfy that hunger. Then there's the fabrication. You find something, how do you figure out how to eat this? You've got to think about it, you've got to plan it, you've got to make changes. And then there's consciousness, which is aware of all these things. And as the Buddha says, we suffer not only in the feeding, but also in feeding on these things, feeding on the activities that surround feeding. The mind really gets into these things. So you find something that you really like. What kind of form are you feeding on? What kind of feeling are you feeding on? What kind of perception? What's the image you hold in your mind? The Buddha says one of the reasons we get so tied up in sensual pleasures is that we have the idea that if we experience a particular sensual pleasure, in sensual pleasure, we've gained something. He says we think of it as an acquisition, like a trophy. Well, you engage in the kind of thinking that you know, how you're better than somebody else, focusing on their bad habits so that you can feel better about yourself. You feel that you've placed yourself a notch up. Well, what kind of perception is that? It's probably there in the mind someplace. So we have to learn how to undo these perceptions. And of course, the way we fabricate around the things that we like. You can see this in a... You're planning a meal. You can think for days about how you want the meal to be. This is one of the reasons why they serve meals in special restaurants with really nice atmosphere, because then the atmosphere becomes part of the meal. You can, the mind can go off on that. They talk about all these exotic ingredients. Well, human food is pretty much human food. There's not much there, no matter how you dress it up. that you put into dressing up your pleasures or dressing up your pains. But there's nothing there. And sometimes what's there is poisonous. So you've got to look at your feeding habits. And we feed on your feeding habits. And then ask yourself, what are the results that come from all this? There are lots of really unskillful ways of feeding that lead you to act and speak and think in very unskillful ways that cause a lot more suffering. It's like the potato chips that make you hungry for more potato chips, and you keep eating them and eating them, and then you go down and have your blood tested and discover that you've got potato chip grease in your blood. And all the salt has given you hypertension. So it's important that you develop this quality of being willing to look at your own unskilled habits so you can see them clearly. This is why we work on developing the equanimity that allows us to watch the mind, get it into concentration, or we try to develop the concentration so we can go even deeper. We develop that sense of awareness. You can see how the mind and the breath, after they've been together for a while, then naturally part ways. Your awareness is one thing, the breath is something else. Not because you have a preconceived notion of their difference, but you put them together. Until they fall apart on their own. They split on their own. And when you have that sense of awareness, then you can watch whatever happens, whatever comes, whatever goes. And again, it's not simply to become equanimous about it. 
that you use that equanimity in order to see what's going on here. Pose questions in the mind, probe around a little bit. When something comes up that you sense may be unskillful, why do you feed on it? What gratification are you getting right now? You don't have to trace it back to your childhood. Just right now. What assumptions are being fed? What perceptions are being fed? This is what you're trying to comprehend. As the Buddha said, when you really comprehend what's going on, there's going to be a sense of dispassion. There's a letting go. And the desire that kept all those processes going just stops. If you haven't reached that point yet, you haven't really comprehended what's going on. You've got to keep looking again and again. Because ultimately where you want to go is the place where there is no desire, not because you've tried to starve it, but because you've looked at all the possible food there is on the one hand, and seeing that there's nothing really worthwhile. But also you bring the mind to, to a sense, a dimension inside that doesn't need to feed. As the Buddha said in that same sutta, that, where he talks about all things being rooted in desire, all all things are all phenomena, have unbinding as their final end. The body itself is not a phenomenon, it's not a dhamma, it's something beyond dhammas. That's where you want to go. That is something that's not produced by food, and that's why it's totally reliable. You don't have to eat anymore. As John Fuhr used to say, what we're here for is purity of heart. And the body is the only thing that really is totally pure. But to get there, you have to deal with a lot of impure things in your mind and not be blown away by them. And you have to make, make use of this property of desire, the desire to really put an end to suffering and not just keep fooling around. Even though ultimately you're going to go beyond that desire, still you want to cultivate it as long as you need it. Remember the image of the raft. So eventually you let go of the raft after you've gotten over on the other side. But while you're going across the river, and this is the river that leads down to whirlpools and waterfalls, you've got to hang on to the raft. And keep, keep using your feet, keep using your hands to paddle your way across. That's the only way that you get to safety. 